So tell me about the U.S. when you when you came over in the early 2000s. Six million of revenue. Six million. Yes, okay. and ninety five doors. <laughs> you see, that's amazing. Even you're laughing yeah. about this. <laughs> so I had to go door to door yeah. to introduce myself, and some people, and I'm not going to name them. Yeah. Some people told me, Ode Marpillet, get out. <laughs> and by leaving the place, in my mind, I was saying to myself, one day, you got to beg me to get happy. Okay, guys, we have a special episode of Talking Watches. Today, we have Francois, the global CEO of Audemars Piguet, and we are actually in your office in Le Bresson, where you spent the last 11 years of your life. This is my last day in this very office at Audemars Piguet, and you are the one experiencing this and living this with me. And how do you feel? Completely fine. You're okay with it? Completely fine. So how many years has it been at Audemars Piguet? 29. 29. And what did you start as? A sales, uh, sales, not director, but sales something in uh, France. In France. And this yes. is after your golfing career? No, this is out of fashion. Golf, 18 to 23. Uh -huh. 23 to 30 years old fashion. Mm -hmm. When you say fashion, what do you, what do you mean? We were the distributors of uh, Italian fashion brands for the French market. Okay. And then how did you get into watches? Completely by luck. I met someone in St. Bart's that my wife then unknown for years mm -hmm. she connected us together six months later the guy offered me because he didn't have other mafia he was in charge of breckling for the french market mm -hmm. and he said i'm getting other mafia uh, i need someone but i said but i don't know anything about watches yeah and he said you'll do fine <laughs> it's almost better that way yeah and you were also really into swatch for a while back then i was a huge swatch collector because yeah. I started the collection in, in 1986-87, yeah. so 1,200 watches altogether. You own 1,200 swatches. And I sold my collection to Swatch. Did you really? Yes, in 1996. No kidding. Except few, which I still have in my house, yeah. which are the one made for the Olympic Games in Atlanta for 1996. And why is that the one that you kept? To... Because this is the first time that they made a bronze silver and gold watch for the winners of the medals uh -huh. and you could collect everything else with few exceptions yeah. that i still got don't ask me how <laughs> but when i saw them my collection i told them listen i'm going to keep those but you need to give me even though i didn't win any medal the bronze the silver and the gold and i got them so quickly run us through the watches that that you chose to bring here today okay so we're going to start with this this one that baby because this is the end of days sure Arnold Schwarzenegger, the movie, not a very successful movie, but a very successful watch. The first limited edition, the first PVD, mm -hmm. treated AP ever. We made 500 watches and uh, we raised a substantial amount of money for Arnold's foundation. So we did so, so something very good. Yeah. At a time where the Piguet was by far not what it is today. So that's also the, that's what I call the birth of success. That's where it starts. Second one, I should pick, I'm going to do this one, but I'm, you have to imagine that watch being black, not blue. Right. Because there is a, when we launched the watch, the black ceramic, I knew on instantly that that, would, that watch would be a success. Incredible. But the reactions were mind blowing. Con from the consumers? Un unbelievable. We had never expected on a function perpetual calendar that was almost dead. Right. Dead, not only for AP, for many other watch companies, we revived the whole thing with a black ceramic perpetual calendar. Mm -hmm. So then, yes, we got the black one, then with the skeleton version of the black, we got the white, now the blue. Yeah. So I've got to share with you a secret about the blue. That's not the blue I wanted. <laughs> what blue did you want? Navy. So how did we end up here? Because we couldn't get anything else but this. <laughs> And now this watch we see on the wrist of Tom Brady, Ed Sheeran, all the guys. Yeah. Yes. And because, first of all, we made only 250 of, of, yeah. of them, but the Navy is coming. Is it? Yes. <laughs> and I'm not there anymore. <laughs> it took me 10 years to finally see the Navy coming. That's amazing. Okay. So, but the, the ceramic family, family yeah. okay, the Change franchise yeah. in perpetual calendars, 
beyond. And remember what I'm telling you today. We are far from being done. I, I know what's coming. Yeah. Get ready. Yeah, it's good. Oh, yeah. Then this, Black Panther. We got crushed a lot for that one. <laughs> I remember. From clients, from non-clients, and from uh, people in the industry. Yeah. Say, so, what's happening, AP? Marvel? What, what's this? It's yeah. gimmicky, doesn't work, whatever. First of all, that watch has been an outstanding success. Sure. There is no doubt. We could go back to 2005 and say, that's a new world. And people have discounted too quickly what that could mean going forward mm -hmm. for the watchmaking industry as well and for the culture. Yeah. So I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, we'll see when people look back at this and what they will say. But I'm very confident that there is something very, very special about us partnering with Marvel, launching with Black Panther and achieving what we've achieved. Yeah. Spider-Man. Who doesn't love Spider-Man? Okay, exactly. You have to understand when we sat down the first time in the Marvel offices in Los Angeles, they told us that Spider-Man was the number one franchise. They showed us every single movie that would come out for the following five, six years because it's really, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. The organization is beyond and Spider-Man so was uh, this year. And we pushed the envelope even further in terms of look, vibe, and what the watch stands for. Again, some people crushed it, but we are delivering the watches as we speak. And I can tell you that uh, it's unbelievable. And I love the fact that at the end, it's not because you are 40, 50, or 60 years old that you cannot just have fun wearing a very high-end, complicated watch. Right. There is one watch missing, though. Here. 1159. Sure. A military preparation. I mean, we're, we were in Oman in November with the entire team, mm -hmm. working like crazy to make sure that everybody would master the launch of the watch because we're launching 13 references, six new mechanisms, which had never been done with AP and maybe never been done with any other watch companies before. Yeah. It was a huge challenge and everything had to be done the right way. Mm -hmm. And how funny it is that on Sunday evening before the Monday of the SIHH, special event at the museum, which was not done yet, outstanding evening with clients, press loving the watch at midnight, not 11.59, when we released the images on social media, we started to get crushed. Right. And arriving at the booth on Monday, everybody was bashing us, but bad, very bad. And many things were told which were so stupid, but that's a lesson because there is a, a scene which we kept, we have the video of that moment where I spoke to the team, a little bit like in a, being in a locker at halftime yeah. in the world of sports, and basically reassuring everyone that we were not to be ashamed of the watch we launched. We were supposed to be confident about what would happen, and nothing could stop us. And eventually on Tuesday, we started to have clients say, but guys, it's actually cool. Yeah. You have to look at it in real. And then on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and on Friday when we stopped, what did we get? Code 1159 was, was on everybody's mouth. Yeah. Everyone was talking about it, good or bad, but everyone knew the name. Sure. So check, yeah. done, and then we could start. Yeah. Code 1159 is here to stay. You'll see. Okay. And then finally, the watch on your wrist. So when I started to on the CEO position in 2012, was I was wearing pretty much offshores. And to think I'm going to end up living with a jumbo, 39 millimeter, and looking at the watch and say, that's a cool one actually, using BMG, mm -hmm. new material. Very difficult to play with, but so cool in the sense of you can have that polish aspect and no scratches at all, which is really, and the weight. Wow. Okay. Like you say, in your country, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. We make all together, all materials together, less than 2,000 jumbos a year. No kidding. Yeah. So it's really a specialty product. So it's, sure. it's not like manufactured scarcity. No, no, no. It's a maximum of 2,000 watches per year. Across every yes. material. Yeah. Yes.
So it's 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 uh, protected. Uh, yes, like and I can tell you even without it's not a lie. We're supposed to get 150 of those this year. Right. We're only going to get 54 right. to be precise because we have we had issues in the manufacturing of the BMG, which are, as I say it's not that easy to play with. Yeah. So tell me about AP in in the early 90s. What was it like? We were not obviously where we are today. So we are selling the watches by hand. So we are traveling with the suitcases with the collection, yeah. going from door to door to, to hopefully sell one or two watches a week right. to retailers, not to clients, to retailers. So the sell in. Yes, which means that they were then giving big discounts to not sell them, but get rid of them. Right. Okay. And paying us never, pretty much. Retailers paying you never. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so this is what you call the hardcore way of learning how to sell uh, high-end luxury brands. And if we were selling two or three watches a week, then it was celebration, champagne, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what was like, uh, give me, give all of us an idea of what it was like for the, let's say the, the big brands, the Rolex, the Patek of the world. Was it similar for them or was it easier for no, them? No, right. Uh, it, so nothing, you cannot compare what was going on then to what's going on now yeah. in terms of awareness volumes, prestige, everything, education, yeah. name it. But Rolex was obviously already the brand, sure. no doubt. We were experiencing, experiencing all the same things. The Vachons of the world, the Breguets of the world, uh, where we are very, very behind. The big brands were then Rolex, Omega, Breitling, Tag. Yeah, kind of mainstream luxury brands. Sure. Yeah. And what was your sales pitch back then? Love me. <laughs> you personally? No, it was, uh, listen, it's a fantastic brand. The, 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 the usual thing that I've been taught to say, it's a fantastic brand owned by the families, still very independent. Yeah. And the whole thing, please buy one. Yeah. <laughs> just, just one. Yeah. Please buy one for me. Yeah. And the product back then was, was Royal Oak. And then, of course, off, Offshore came around that time. So Royal Oak, Royal Oak Offshore, and then Millenary. I launched the Millenary in 1995. The event was, it was a dinner that happened at the Tour d'Argent with the three emperors. We made a special set of millenaries of unique pieces, number ones, that we, all, that we sold, not auctioned off, yeah. sold. Yeah. But I will always remember because we spent a fortune for the event then. And I got a letter from the CEO in Switzerland that said that I would never be able to spend that kind of money on events ever again in my life. <laughs> well, you proved him wrong. Yeah. <laughs> because we spent 2 million French francs, okay, for one evening in Paris, so which is roughly today, it would be 300,000. Right, that's like not even one of these watches. Yeah, 250,000 euros. <laughs> yeah. But if you think about it, that was 1995, in 2000, we spend over 2 million US for time to give with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mohammed Ali to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the company. Right. And, and I'm still around. <laughs> you are still around. And so how did you make the jump from, from being a salesman in France to, to, to headquarters in the US and then, then back? So first of all, I stayed in France only for 18 months. Okay. And then through a convention that we had in uh, Scotland where all the distributors were invited, uh, I was the youngest one and I was already very loud on what could be done with the brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy in charge of Singapore said, I want that guy to come and run AP Singapore for me because his father-in-law was running it mm -hmm. and he was going to retire. He said, I want that kid to, to do this for me. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Singapore for almost a year. And after succeeding in Singapore, so I got hired by, Switz by the headquarter here. So I moved to Switzerland from 96 to 1999, where I was in charge of different markets, but I was uh, traveling like crazy. Right. And in 1999, I asked if I could get a real region, a real responsibility, and they gave me the US market because the US market was a no market, basically. And they say, okay, we're gonna open a subsidiary, go and run uh, the US market. So you were the, the first president of, of AP North America. It didn't yeah. exist before. No. It was just run through what? A distributor. Yeah. Yeah. Who was the distributor? Marcus Magoris. In the US? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the US, Switzerland, and the UK. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. 
That's, I just didn't know that. Um, and so tell me about the US when you, when you came over in the early 2000s. Six million of revenue. Six million? Yes, okay. and 95 doors. <laughs> you see, that's amazing. Even you're laughing yeah. about this. <laughs> so I had to go door to door yeah. to introduce myself with my very thick French accent. Yeah. And some people, and I'm not going to name them, yeah. some people told me, Oh, de Marpillet, get out. <laughs> and by leaving the place, in my mind, I was saying to myself, one day you got to beg me to get happy. You got to remember that you threw me out of your store. And what was so wrong with AP at that point? Everything. Product, behavior, uh, way to deal with people, yeah. keeping your words, not keeping your words, basically. Right. Everything was bad. The worst of the worst. We didn't start from scratch. We started from minus four. Right. And so how did, how did you start to change the tide of things? I mean, it's starting from zero, literally, yes. to, to where we are today. I mean, it, it's only been 20 plus years, but I mean, how did you really start to gain momentum to get to things like this, to get to Jay-Z, to get to LeBron? It takes a, a long time. So first of all, one retailer at a time. Yeah. Who's going to support us immediately? Right. And few of them did. Who was it? The two early supporters, Cellini, West Ham. And West Ham by far the most. Right. And what was it about the Simonians in West Ham that really just made it work for AP? We developed a friendship, yeah. a relationship. And you have to understand also, John Simonian, when he came to the US, came with almost no money. Right. And his very first location, he was denied Seiko as a distributor. So he had already AP when I moved to the US, but it was doing nothing per year. But we managed to connect. We became very, very close friends. And through the course of the years, every time I came to him to help us, supporting your cause, supporting Arnold when we started to, to work together, he was always there. And slowly but surely, we increased the sales yeah. and the presence. Shane and the same, and then few others. And while we are doing that, 2000, these two. These guys. Yeah. And so how do you get, in the year 2000, how do you get these two guys, arguably, I mean, not arguably, two of the biggest names and faces in the That's world? That's a funny story. So Arnold came here because he was close friend with one of our shareholders okay. for years. Yeah. And he came for the first time in 1998. I was living here. So I got the mission to connect with him and uh, see what we could do together. Mm -hmm. And eventually I flew to the US uh, in 1999 before moving to the US to offer him uh, a possibility to buy watches. And through that lunch that we had together, we decided to make a watch for end of days. But then when I was in the US and I called him and said, Arnold, we need to do a charity auction uh, for the celebration of the online 25th anniversary. He said, okay, under one condition, you go and get Mohammed Ali. I said, go get Muhammad Ali. Yeah, I said, uh, like what? Like uh, Mohammed Ali, I call and he's gonna come? Yeah. Say, you go and get Mohammed Ali. I'll do the event with you. And through uh, me uh, hustling here and there, I got a connection, I got a connection, and I say, and he said, yes, let's go. Yeah. So now I had Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mohamed Ali co-chairing a charity event by Audemars Piguet. I can guarantee you something. The celebrities that were not picking up the phone the day before all wanted to be involved. 125th anniversary of the company, mm -hmm. big charity auction, November, New York, Christie's, 35 celebrities wore our watches for weeks or months. All the watches were engraved with our names. And we auctioned off these 35 watches and we raised that night 1.5 million, which was unheard of right. in the world of high-end watches. And so you have a relationship with, certainly with, with Arnold to, to, to this day, but I mean, sure. in many ways, he was kind of the the one that broke the seal, if I may say, Completely. in terms of ambassadors, in terms of relationships. Ambassadors and reach. Right. Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of the biggest stars, if not the biggest star, the movie star in the world. Yeah. Okay. So with him endorsing somehow Audemars Piguet made a huge impact, obviously, on the awareness of the brand. Right. And beyond the borders of the US, because even when we launch End of Days, right. We launched the watch in the US, but we launched the watch also in Tokyo. Right. So immediately the brand changed the, its perception. And so from, from Arnold, I would say, and you tell me if this is correct, from my vantage point, the next big break for the brand and, and you was the relationship with Jay-Z. 
Yes, that was that was a completely different one. So I made Jay for the first time in 2001. Right. And he had already 14 Audemars Piguet watches. 14? 14. Including a triple complication, the ancestor of the grand complication. So on the first time we met, he said, one day we'll make a watch together. And I say, good luck with that. <laughs> you said that. Oh, not telling him. Yeah, of course. But I was thinking, yeah. good luck with that. So I, I think... In the year 2023, 2024, like that, that will make no sense because Jay Z is as famous as it gets, one of the most powerful people in the world, an icon, and AP is is obviously a partner to to many athletes, etc. But why why was it so challenging to launch the watch? Yeah, because if you go back there, you will never see at that time a luxury brand actually partnering with culture, right? Hip hop. A person of color, really. Yeah. yeah. And I convinced the management then to say, listen guys, hip hop is now going to what was a jazz in the 20s. We have to go on that one. I feel it's the right move to make and Jay is the absolute perfect person to do it with. Yeah. And they say, okay, under two conditions. You make a watch only for the US and you make only 100 watches. And of the 100 watches, there were 50 watches in stainless steel, 30 in rose gold and 20 in platinum. Mm -hmm. I say, good enough. Yeah. I'm going to play with that. And guess what? Press conference, Four Seasons Hotel on 57th, 9 a.m., flawless, because it was real. We right. had already 14 of our watches. We, and from 2001, 2005, we saw each other many, many times. So it was an easy thing to convey that it was not faked in any way, shape, or form. The watch sold out in almost two months. And two and months back then was, was really fast. Now stuff sells out in two minutes. Very fast. Yeah. Yeah. And that reopened the doors to a complete new world. Right. Because that was also the arrival of the Beats. Yeah. Remember? By Dre, yeah. And most of, in many, many songs, Jay was mentioning on the Piguet, then Beyonce spoke about AP, then many others started to talk about AP, and that was like a, yeah. a huge new wind into the world of sports, entertainment, and youth. Because many young people that had never heard about the brand Sony were listening to a new name. Yeah. So we, we basically broke the mold on opening the gates to have two, two worlds going together, right. street and culture, obviously, right. and luxury. Right, traditional European luxury. Completely. So a, a turning point for, for me as a, somebody that observed the brand and was involved to, to some degree was 2012, 40th anniversary. I would say, I mean, there was a, I would say from my perspective, a revived interest in Royal Oak at the very least. I mean, I think we can say the Royal Oak was not the strongest seller for, for, for some time. Offshore was. Offshore, but not traditional Royal Oak. Sure. Yeah. And then all of a sudden people started to care. And I think it was that, that new revised 15202 that, that changed things. Yeah. And it, but it's funny because we almost killed the 15202 in 2011. Could you imagine? Why? What was the thinking? It was not selling. Yeah. It was selling only in Italy, in Germany a little bit. And that's pretty much it. No, but it's funny to think that there was a discussion at some point that made us say, you know what? Maybe we should stop. Which is insane. It's insane. But that proves as well. That's the beauty of, of running businesses. That sometimes in the middle of a, a storm right. or whatever, you could take very wrong decisions right and that's okay was it was it close to happening or was it just yes it uh, really was oh yeah <laughs> so the whole royal oak collection or just the 15202 the 15202 that's wild at that time people were judging it being too small too thin to do nothing right and boom so in 2012 right after the 40th anniversary you you came to to run the company globally mm -hmm. and immediately went into to changing how production was done to have fewer uh, SKUs and basically have a core core family, effectively. Exactly, and to be able to deliver on time, which was never happening before. Yeah, and what what was it? Uh, was it that and anything else that that changed the the, per the perception of AP? No, it was a mix of three things: delivering the watches on time. Turns out that less helps. points of sale. Yeah, and putting and starting to put watches on people's wrists. Aha, and on the good wrists. So talk to me about that, because you're, you're, I would say, famous. I mean, you're, you're well known for putting watches on the wrists of the right people. But it's also in the world of entertainment, yeah. the Arnolds of the world, but also the people of, from the business side. Mm -hmm. 
At that time, we are talking about uh, John Mack, chairman of Morgan Stanley. We are talking about uh, Tish, John Tish, mm -hmm. okay, who owns the Giants. And when you start to see major players in the world of business wearing Audemars Piguet and starting to send me pictures of them wearing the watches, ending up on the same tables during uh, dinners or whatever, and I say, that's the way it starts. And at that time, we, we couldn't spend so much money. Right. In, in a brand like AP, you would spend 10% of your total revenue in marketing. So what we did, nothing fancy, if you were a client of the Piguet and you're living in a nice house, mm -hmm. we'd say, can I use your house for one evening where you're going to call your friends, yeah. neighbors, pretty much the same level of wealth, mm -hmm. okay? And we're going to organize a special event in your house. We're going to pay for the dinner for everyone, the cocktails. We're going to bring a watchmaker to explain a little bit. And one at a time, one client at a time, one wrist at a time, we started to, it's like the top aware business. Yeah. Yes. And it really worked. Completely. And we would touch people at some point. And I will always remember we are, we are at the dinner in Detroit, in somebody's house. And clients came after the dinner and say, I'm going to start to buy AP. I didn't know anything about AP, but I'm going to buy AP because you do golf. The other one, well, I'm going to buy AP because I love what you do with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Boom, I'm going to buy AP. Another one say, I love that tradition. I love the fact that you are family owned. I'm going to buy a watch as well. And this is when you realize that all the plans you could have in marketing meetings, all the type of things, are not always as perfect as you want them to be. Right, right. I mean, in, in that case, I mean, it really came down to really being on the ground and, and telling the story. Yeah. Yeah. One client at a time. Yeah. And then how do you jump from, from that era into today, where you were one of the top five brands in Switzerland? multi-billion dollars uh, per year. I mean, arguably the, the hottest brand in, in the retail environment. What changed between then and now? Something that nobody had planned. In 2015, Apple Watch showed up. I know. And if you do remember, at the SIHH, all the journalists were telling us, the brands, that we would actually die again. And around that time, a generation that was supposed to be dead for watchmaking, the young generation yeah. that would either never wear a watch or wear smart watches, showed up. No one, no one saw that coming. Right. No one. So we saw youth coming to the world of watchmaking with appreciation for craftsmanship, exclusivity, everything. Yeah. And suddenly, the funny thing is, the kids were bringing their parents to the brands. But the kids have got something that the parents don't have. Social media, right. basically. The kids are the, the true ambassadors in today's world. Yeah. They are the one preaching the world to what we do and who we are. Yeah. So if in terms of language, attitude, behavior, communication, you connect with them, then it goes. Right. And that's what happened. Especially with AP, obviously. Right because we saw this rise of people coming yeah. and add to this in 2020 COVID, right. where people were stuck in their homes, time to surf on the internet yeah. and people talking to each other here or there. And then, so between the kids showing up in 2015 and uh, another type of people coming in 2020, you saw an arrival of a number of people wanting the watches that made the watches go to the to the roof in yeah. 2021 and 22. Right, and I would say AP of, of all the brands, uh, but everyone has benefited to some degree. AP has benefited in arguably the most. I mean, the precipitous rise in terms of sales for AP mm -hmm. over the past three years has been crazy. Mm -hmm. What what did you do kind of behind the scenes to ensure that you guys would, were able to take advantage of that the best way? Making sure that we would stay who we were. At some point, I will write a book. I will not be the one writing, sure. but I will. there will be a book. Yeah. And they will be a chapter of success yeah. because there is an absolute dark side on success. Sure. Success can drive people nuts. Success can take people out of their normal place. And you have always to remember where you come from, who helped you to get where you are, and never think that because of that growth and success, it's a given forever. 
So this is uh, obviously one of your final days here as, as the CEO of AP. Is, is there any memory that really stands out to you as, as kind of the thing that, that, that changed your life in, in many ways? You know, we were in Lisbon last week. There was a convention to show the new product for 2024 to over like close to 300 people. Yeah. It was a very emotional time because that was my last. So I dropped the mic, first of all. But by sharing with the people the memories, there are many. It's not one. Yeah. It's many, many. It's many, but in, it's always linked to people and the way we succeeded together through easy things and very tough ones and tough times. Yeah. But the, the, the reward is what happened. It's the, that harmony of being together and celebrating together the end of a moment, okay? Long moment, 11 years. Yeah. But seeing in people's eyes being real, the respect, the, uh, the appreciation and the friendship. Yeah, it's special. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think for, for me, I mean, we've known each other a long time and I think something that, that many of the guys at home may not know is you, when you were the, the president of AP North America, actually gave me my first advertising check ever. Mm. Sincerely. And that check probably paid for my life in Houdinki for at least six months, maybe a year. And so without you, in many ways, I'm not here. And it's amazing, the relationship. I'm so stuff. happy that you're sharing with this with everyone publicly once and for all, because with the money that you earn now, <laughs> I think payback should be maybe 20% of the value of the business. Something like that. That's yes, fair. sure, sure. So I'm going to send you my uh, wiring instructions, okay? And, <laughs> and you've got to just send the money and we've got to be good. Fair enough. It's easy enough. Uh, could you please confirm in front of everyone that you... <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's amazing still after, you know, 2008 is when we first met, uh, that you're still here, I'm still here, and uh, we go on. Ben, I, I wanted to finish on something. I'm glad that you remember that I was the first one to give you a check, but you've been very helpful, not for the MAPIA, but for the watch industry. You've been an eye-opener to many people in the US and now in the world. You never lost your path in a sense of, oh, I'm more successful, so now you change as a, as a person. Yeah. And I will always respect you for that. And mark my word, we are not done yet. Okay, you heard it here first. Francois, thank you so much. Thank you.